So this lesson today is perishing in the pew, and this is in part uh, my testimony, my husband's testimony. Um, the Lord has used this lesson um, in Kenya, Africa, to bring people who were in the church who were lost to salvation. He's used it in Bolivia to even bring a uh, pastor's wife to salvation. And it's I've been passionate about this lesson for a long time because I just feel like most of the people that I know, Amy included, who's with me, and Joni Caudell, who's here with me, both of these ladies can give testimony, as can many others who were raised in the church or went to church and prayed a prayer when they were a child, as I did when I was 12, and then remained lost until the Lord did an incredible work. Salvation belongs to the Lord who sits on His throne and unto the Lamb, and salvation is of the Lord and from the Lord and wrought by the Lord and accomplished by the Lord. So, um, and it is faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But this lesson is very um, personal to me, and you'll see why. So, I've titled it Perishing in the Pew, and Romy is, is translating it in some other languages. And what, what does she use, perishing in the church? Perishing in the church house. Perishing in the church house. Okay, so um, this lesson is um, about the last church, the lost church of Laodicea, but also in Matthew 13. So I'm going to just dive right in, and I'm going to read Matthew 13, excuse me, 7, 13 through 27. Um, well, okay, what is wrong with this picture? Okay, there we go. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Okay, right off the bat, the gate that leads to hell is what? Wide. wide. And how many are on it? Many. Lot, a lot. The gate that leads to heaven is narrow. And how many are on that road? Just a few. You can find it. Okay, so um, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but outwardly they are ra inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from bush thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree that bears good fruit. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There, therefore, everyone who hears the words the words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet it did not fall, for it has been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does not act on them will be like a, compared to a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Um, so, in this, in this passage, we see that there are two roads. I love it when the Bible is black and white. And in this, in this passage of Scripture, we see very clear that there is a wide road, and many people own it, and there is a narrow road that leads to life, and few there be that find that road. Then we see that there are false prophets. Um, in another passage, it says that there are many false prophets. And so 
he compares them to a good tree and a bad tree good fruit and bad tr fruit and that we will know them again god does want us to know to be able to identify when someone is is um true and who's not and these false prophets and false teachers lead people astray from from the narrow road and and the most um, diabolical plan that they have to do that is by teaching false doctrine and making people believe that they're on the narrow road when in fact they are on the right road headed to hell. He keeps them blinded. Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And then we see two houses. Again, one built on the sand, one built on the rock. Both houses, there's two things that the houses had in common. They both heard God's word both houses could be compared to a person or a life or a family or a church. Both houses um, had storms blow against the houses. The only difference in, the, in these two houses, both of them heard, both of them had a, a different foundation. But the difference, the one difference that made the one house stand is those who heard God's word and did it. Who, who obeyed the word of God. So uh, we're going to talk about the last church at Laodicea at first, but I just want to give you some background to why this story is personal to me. So I had been saved for a few years when I wrote my very first Bible study. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was putting my personal testimony down on paper. The study was based on this passage, Matthew 7, 13-27, that I, the title a Road Less Traveled was borrowed from a poem that I selected from my senior quote for the high school yearbook. The poem was, was The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. At the time of my graduation, this poem had an entirely different meaning for me. I was traveling at that, at that point. Um, I was in church. I was in high school from the time I was 12 years old to this, this point. Up to this point in my life, I was religious and lost and sinful and totally deceived. I was like these um, on the wide road. So I was traveling my own path of destruction and going my own way on the wide road. However, it certainly wasn't the road less traveled because, again, we just read that many, many who are on the wide path don't know it. And... And so that's the easy road. That's the road that leads to destruction. So the truth is, from the Garden of Eden forward, we are all, all of us are born on the wide road of rebellion, wandering sheep who are separated from the Good Shepherd, um, lost and hopeless and homeless and, um, and deceived. And Isaiah 53, 6 says this, All of us have wandered off like sheep. Each of us has strayed off to his own way, his own path, but the Lord has caused all the sin, the sin of us all to fall on Jesus. So these passages from Matthew 7 um, and also Matthew 13 and also Revelation 3, we, we're going to look at these two roads. We're going to look at two kinds of trees, two kinds of houses, two kinds of church attenders, and each, each of these um, have eternal consequences. So my prayer is that the Lord will use his light and his truth to reveal which road you are on. And if you find that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction, that you can, you can turn. Uh, repentance means to have an about face. You can, you can take the narrow path and that the Lord would use his word to bring to light the truth the truth about what's really happening in your heart at this moment because the Lord is not willing that anyone should perish but for all to come to repentance. So the road that makes all the difference. So my husband Art is not only intelligent, he's, he's also quite artistic. And um, his most famous work, in my opinion, was done his senior year of high school and I am going to um, share this with you. He will not be happy with me, but anyway, <laughs> the year that my husband <laughs> graduated from high school, he painted this picture of Elvis. It was, the, it was the year that Elvis passed away, and he entered that in a contest, and 
Elvis lives in the closet, by the way. We're not exactly Elvis fans around here. It was just um, a good a good subject matter since Elvis had just passed away that year and he did he, I think he won second place but um, so he painted that picture and I took that picture to Elvis to enter to Graceland Elvis's home which is here in our hometown to enter him into a contest and I thought I was going to make enough money off of Elvis to sell him and that they would buy him and I could pay for my daughter's wedding well that didn't happen but um, Elvis, uh, they they offered to take Elvis and put him in Graceland, um, but they weren't going to pay me for Elvis. So anyway, he he made the local news that night, and then we took we went and got Elvis, brought him home, and put him back in the closet where he lives. So I had to get him out of the closet to share him with you. But anyway, he's still alive. He's still alive. He still lives in the closet. Elvis is in our closet. In the closet. But um, so when I wrote my study on Matthew um, seven for the ladies at my church, I asked Art if he would paint a picture for us of the wide and narrow road. Hence, ta-da! Here's the picture that he painted. Now, now here's the thing about it. Um, when Art painted this picture, um, he was still lost. He had not been saved. I was saved at 26 years old. We were married equally yoked. Two years after we were married, when my baby, my daughter was born, my firstborn was born, we, um, I was born again. The Lord saved me. And for the next 13 years, I prayed for art. So this was during that time. Of course, I didn't see any signs of life. There was no signs of life in him. Uh, there was no love or passion for Jesus or the things of God. Although both my husband and I, both of us went to church always. So we were in church and art painted this picture. But there was something about the picture I never liked. I never liked... Amy, if you can help me, just lift the picture up and bring it closer. I never liked Elvis's face. I mean, <laughs> Jesus's face. <laughs> oh my goodness, Jesus's face, because he looks like a country singer whose name is Travis, Travis Tritt. Um, I just never liked this face because to me, I never, this was not the face of the Jesus that I saw the day that the Lord opened my eyes. We know that in 2 Corinthians 4, it says that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. But God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. So the truth was that my husband was blind he had not seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus. He was religious. He was in the church. He was a member of the church, just as I was. But he was lost. But he, the thing is that he didn't know. So, um, if you've ever, I just picture in my mind as an analogy to what was happening. Suppose um, you have an artist who is painting a self-portrait. Okay? And in his portrait, he sees himself as finely dressed and, you know, a handsome man. He's painting a portrait. But there's a mirror beside him. There's a mirror on the wall beside him. And what he sees, what he's painting, how he sees himself is, you know, dressed in his Sunday best. He looks fine on the outside. And... This is this is a truth for a lot of people. They look fine on the outside. They say that Jesus is Lord, Lord. And they do many good things. They teach. I just testified about a pastor's wife who a pastor's wife in the church who was lost and but they can't see. But the true condition, what God sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees what's in the heart. And really only God can see what's in our heart. But picture, if you will, this artist is painting a self-portrait and he looks really good in the picture. But in the mirror, the true mirror that shows what he really looks like, sees him half naked, um, just dirty, filthy, 
unclothed, unkept, and that is the true. The mirror, the mirrors don't lie. Well, God's word is the mirror. God's word is the mirror for our hearts, as James wrote. So my husband is painting this picture, and he's thinking and supposing that he is on the narrow road that leads to life. But the truth is, he's, he's on the wide road. And I, I ask him, you can't see it just an outline, just to your left, Amy, is an outline. I ask him to draw a person who is on the wide road, uh, on the narrow road, reaching down onto the wide road to bring people to Jesus. And so he started an outline and he never finished. So this is an unfinished painting. But it really, it's a picture that paint that worth a thousand words because it truly is a picture of what happens. So he stopped painting. So if he, when he finishes this painting, if he ever decides to finish it, it's going to have people on the wide road dressed in their Sunday best. They're going to be dressed in their Sunday best. But the gate of hell, if you can see over here, the gate of hell is a mirror. It reflects. So it's giving them a reflection. They're looking in the gate of hell and they think that they're fine. They think that they're dressed in righteousness and or self-righteousness. And they think that they're good with God and they think that they're on the narrow road. They think other people, like the prostitutes and the sinners, are on, on this road. But they're in church. And they go to church like we went to church. But they don't realize that they really are on this road. But the truth, the truth is, what they see of themselves, they look really good. And but in the the truth is in the mirror, the true mirror, is a true reflection of their hearts. What God sees is that they're naked, they're pitiful, they're poor, and literally they are blind. They're blind because they're perishing. They're blind because of Satan. God has not yet made His light shine in their hearts. So, that was a picture of my husband, and I was the person who had who'd been rescued, who'd gone through the door, who is the Lord Jesus, and was on the narrow path. And, and in fact, truly, my husband was the one I, I was reaching out to him and, and other people to come to life. And, and you see that there is a shadow of a cross in the middle of this painting. There's a shadow of the cross um, that... Really, you have to pass the cross because the gospel is the power of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes it. So we'll, let's talk about for a second just the wide and the narrow road. So born again Christians have always been in the minority. Um, Jesus made this abundantly clear with the statement for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And it's not the easy road. Um, Amy has lived in China and Nepal and Thailand and Nicaragua and Bangladesh and, and other, she's been to many other countries, India, and it is not, the road that leads to life is not an easy road. And it very much is like being a salmon swimming against the tide of the world. So um, the hordes of people who are lost on the wide road, I mean, some of them are in church, some of them are in bars, it doesn't matter. God came to save all sinners, <laughs> and we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. But to me, when we make a profession of faith without possessing the Holy Spirit, when we, when we walk an aisle but we've not been truly born again, it's like getting an inoculation. An inoculation gives you just enough of whatever it is to keep you from having the full-blown thing. So to me, it's almost easier for people to come to faith who've never known Christ and never heard about Christ than it is for those who are religious. Amy gave the testimony to, myself included, who, who are religious, who are in the church. It's harder because we know all the right answers. We, we can tell, we can quote scriptures, but we don't have the living word in us. We've never received the living word. We can't see that we're sinners ourselves. And we can't see our sins because of our religious hypocrisy. So, um, how is it possible um, 
for someone to lead a life first okay first the road that leads to life is narrow and difficult it requires to be on this narrow road requires death death to sin this death to self-rule death to love of the world and secondly um, Jesus warned us that there would be many false teachers who preach false gospels and again as as we believe and I believe wholeheartedly that we are in the end of days okay from Peter on in Acts 2 at the day of Pentecost he declared we are in the end times but I believe we are nearing because there's there will be a huge falling away there will be a huge apostasy and I think that we are definitely seeing that in the days that we're living in but in any case false gospels are abound and so that's one way that people can be in a church in a denomination um, but be lost so that's one way but um, in the wide road is near is is relatively easy at first because Satan always gives us the best at first he saves the worst for last he paints a picture that this is wide and easy and fun and you know do whatever you want to and you can just confess your sins over and over again you just live like hell and go to church and you say your Hail Marys or you you confess to a priest or whatever and then you'll be okay so that's not true repentance. True repentance is a change of heart, change of mind about sin, about Christ, and a change of heart that leads to a, a changed life and a changed direction. So um, anyway, so the picture, God, Satan never gives you a true picture of, of what's at the end of his road, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whereas the Christian life, the narrow road, it is hard and there and there's not too many of us that's why again it's so important to truly be ch part of a church body where you are truly in a relationship that where we can hold God's word that mirror up close enough to our heart to see if we truly have had a salvation experience which road we are on and if you have people to be accountable to and that only happens in a church environment where you have relationship true transparent relationship then then this is possible and that's why discipleship is so important to me but when we're so there's few of us it's a hard road and this this world this hell and it is feeling less and less like home every day every day we're we're starting to cry out from our hearts from deep within us that this isn't home. We don't feel at home. Nothing's nothing feels like home anymore to us here. And we cry out, look, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Because this is the hell, the only hell we're ever going to have. This is the only death. This is the only sickness. This is the only sin. And so that God saves the best for last. And our and our best will last forever. Whereas Satan gives the best at first and he saves the worst for last. So for a lost person, a person who's on that on that wide road, who remains on that wide road, this is all the heaven. As horrible as this is, the killing, the stealing, the raping, the child molestation, the divorce, the hatred, the abuse, the all of it. This is all the heaven a lost person's ever gonna get to know. But for us, for those on the narrow road, this is all the hell we're ever going to know. And, and God has saved the best for the last for us. So, I want us to turn now to Revelation 3, 14 through 22. Uh, recently, studying through Downline, our last book to study was the book of Revelation. And um, I also... About the same time that my husband was saved, actually the, the time, the very same time that my husband was actually born again, I wrote a study on the book of Revelation, but only the first four books, uh, um, excuse me, the first three chapters. And so I had done a study on this, but when I studied this with, rep, um, with Downline, um, it, it just drove this point home to me. Uh, and John MacArthur, in his, in his Bible, he says that in the church at Laodicea is um, the only um, 
that there's no one, there's not anyone in this church who is saved because it says that Jesus is on the outside. So let's read it and then I'm going to unpack. I'll finish my statement. Um, Revelation 3, 13, excuse me, 14 through 22. Okay. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in, wh in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I have also as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, Joni, can I can I have that Bible? No, <laughs> thank you. My new Bible which I took my new notes in. So I want to break down a little something that I learned in downline, and, and then we're going to make the application here. Okay, so the first church, the letter to the churches, you know, seven churches. So the first is the apostolic age. Ephesians, this is Acts. This was That was the birth of the church, so that was apostolic age. Ephesus. Um, then the next church is Smyrna. This is the Roman... Um, the Roman Church, um, Polycarp and um, Constantine, and um, and then excuse me, in Smyrna there's the persecuting emperors like Nero, and you know Polycarp um, was the first martyr. So, in that church was the martyred church. Then we have Thyatira. Am I missing some? Yes, Pergamum, in in chapter in verse twelve. Um, this was the, let's see, hang on, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, the, the Roman Empire, excuse me, this was the Constantine church, so Ephesus was the first, um, the, the birth of the church, then we have the persecuted church, under the Roman Emperor, then we have Constantine, this is the age from three, 13 to 700 A.D. This was the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the Emperor Church. Then we have Thyatira. This is the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages from 700 to 1500. Um, and they embraced era. Then we have um, Sardis. This is the Reformation Age, 1500s to the 750s. Then we have um, the Age of Revival from 1750 to 1900. Um, and so there was an open door for missions during that point in time. Then we have um, the present, the 1900s. The present age is the industrialized age, the modern age. Um, and they had a church anity, but they didn't have Christ because Christ is outside this church. So this is the last church. We know there's seven, and we believe the rapture will take place. For those of us who believe in the rapture, um, we believe that's going to take place here in verse 4. And what was pointed out to us in this, when we study this passage, is that this is the last word to the church. After this point, the Spirit is not speaking to the church. Where is the church? In 4 and 5, we see the church is heaven, every tribe and nation and language and tongue. So... Um, those who are outside of the church are the ones who are left behind. Those who are on the wide road. who Even, even those on the wide road um, that leads to life, we know that there's a great apostasy for the last 30 minutes. Uh -huh. Okay, here we go. 
So if you have a church where Jesus is outside the building, it's because he's not He's not in there. I remember teaching this lesson in Nicaragua. I don't think that you were with me, Joni, at that time. But I was in Ebenezer Baptist Church on Corn Island, and I'm teaching this lesson, honest to goodness. On one side of the church, there was windows. Of course, all the windows were wooden windows that were open. But there was a door over here that no one used. And in the middle of me teaching, I promise, it's on tape somewhere. It's on, it, it was yeah, kind of like, I don't think I was with you. I'm like, did y'all hear that? <laughs> Do y'all hear that? He's knocking. So he's not in the church. So this is a lost church. The last church is a lost church. And what does he say about it? It is scary. It is scary. Mm -hmm. He says that, um, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth, vomit. In other words, you make me sick. And I, I see myself, I see and apply this passage to where I was before I was saved. I was hypocrite. I was lost. I didn't love Christ. I didn't care about things of God. That's who I was and where I was. Because he says, you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And so, again, these people, why did we need Christ? If we've got plenty of food, we got nice houses, we got all these things, we don't need Him. And that's why the church is lost. And are we not living in an age, yeah. especially in America? We can't really say this for all the world, but we can definitely say this. America. This applies to America. Um and he says, but you do not know, again, you're blinded, that you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, blind, and naked. Again, like the people on the wide road. They don't realize that they're naked. They're not covered in the righteousness of Christ. They are still wearing their filthy, putrid rags of self-righteousness, and it makes him sick. It makes him sick, because they don't even realize how lost they are, how deceived they are, how blind they are, and how they're poor. So they might have everything that the world has to give, but they are empty and lost and dead. This was me, this was my husband, in the church. Members of the church. So when Billy Graham, I always heard Dr. Adrian Rogers and Billy Graham quote this, and, you, and probably other people too, that they, if they had to guess that maybe... 75% of people who attend churches on a regular basis, any denomination, all denomination, are lost. And I always wonder, where do they get that from? Where, I mean, where biblically do they get that from? So, observation. Well, observation, but biblically, where are they getting that statistic from? But when you read these letters, Jesus makes it clear. He, he says, but there are a few of you. There are a few of you. Yeah. And again, how many are on the road that leads to life? You. Many. Oh, how many? How many are going to say to him, Lord, Lord? Didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And what's he going to say to them? Depart. I never knew you. I never knew you. I don't know you. And so this is what we see in the church. This is what I've seen in my life. This is what I was was a reality in my husband's life. And and it's scary to me. Because they don't realize that's the problem. They cannot see their true condition. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so you may become rich and white garments so you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. In other words, just like in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were naked, but they didn't know that they were naked until they sinned. But they were still naked. But God... <laughs> in Christ, made a way, killed a lamb, slayed the lamb, covered them, his people, made a provision, provided a lamb, a ram, a skin, a bloodied skin, no taxidermy, bloodied skin of the first thing to die for them in the garden. And we know that was a picture, that was a mini picture, a symbol of what he was going to do. He did the same thing with Abraham and Isaac. You know, God provided a ram, a lamb. And then when I see the blood, I will pass over. All these little pictures are what 
what he was going to do to cover. We're not going to be saved from the wrath of God by our self-righteousness. No, that's filthy rags in God's sight. The only thing that makes us right in God's sight is to be covered in the blood of the Lamb, to be covered in the blood of Jesus, to believe in His blood sacrifice, His substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. That's the only thing that He's going to, to receive into His kingdom is those who've been covered in the blood, who believe in the blood, who believe in the living Lamb of God. So he says, um, I want you to do this so you can cover the shame of your nakedness. Um, may not be revealed. And I salve to, to anoint your eyes that you may see. Again, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And that's unbelievers even in church. Unbelievers who are religious but lost. He's blinded them. He says that you may see. And Laodicea... Um, historically, Laodicea was known for its industry, its clothing apparel. You know, it was a it was a trade center. They had ISAD, they had medicines, but they didn't realize that they were sick and dying, and that their destiny was hell. That this was the road that they were on, but they thought they were on the road that leads to life. So he's saying, and again, who is he talking to? He's not talking to the to the sinners and the prostitutes. No. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying his last words that we have heard from him after he ascended back to the Father. He leaves these last words and he's speaking to the church. He's speaking to people who are in the church. He says, those who I love, how does he feel about them? He says, those who I love, I, I discipline and reprove. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Again, he's not in the church because he's not in them. This is a person. This is maybe a family. and It may be an entire congregation or a denomination. It could be all of these things. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and him with me. That's another reason I feel like the next part is... is part of the wedding supper of the Lamb. <laughs> I think that's part of it. He says, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. That's the next thing we see is him sitting on his throne. And I, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, the person without the Spirit doesn't have ears to hear. The person who has not been born again, truly born again, can't hear or is not his sheep. They can't hear his voice. And so, but his his desire is that um, from 1 Peter, 2 Peter 3, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that is even people in the church. So I want to, um, I want to just read a little bit that I have written here as we close out. Religious people can be lost in houses of worship because they are blind to the fact that they are sinners. So that's the very first thing that God has to open our eyes to see. To see Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to those who are perishing. Um, to us, it's a fragrance of life now that we know Him. So we have to see that He died for our sins in my place. For my sins. It's a personal thing. It's the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. They're blinded by their good works. Didn't we prophesy in your name? They're blinded by their religion. It's like getting an inoculation. They get just enough knowledge of the written word of God to convince them that they don't really need Christ. In their warped reasoning, they think, I'm a good person. My good deeds outweigh my bad. Therefore, I have earned a place in heaven. Why do they need Christ? In the words of Jesus to the church at Laodicea, they say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth. I need nothing. I, I, I. But they do not realize that they are wretched. Okay. Okay. All right, we're taping again. Okay, so to to finish up this lesson, so um, 
The biggest problem is that they do not realize how sickening their self-righteousness is to the Lord. And that was definitely my case. It was, it was my case until my eyes were open and I saw the Lord Jesus on the cross. And he showed me my sin, he showed me my Savior, and he showed me the cure. And I believed and received him. And I confessed him as my Lord. Even though I thought it was a rededication, that was actually my salvation. But going to a church building and having your name on a row does not mean that you are a Christian. There are churches of all denominations filled with misguided people who are trusting in their church affiliation, their reformations, they've tried to reform their lives, their confirmations, their dedications, and their family relations. My grandma laid the cornerstone of the building um, or it doesn't matter as their ticket to heaven but just because your name is on the roster of a church does not mean that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Sadly, many who think they are on, going to heaven when they die are in for a rude awakening. So what's the cure to this problem for those who, who realize that this is me? Our next lesson in the, our last lesson in this uh, phase number one, our gospel lessons, our signs of life. We're going to do that. But what does Jesus say to this church? He says, I love you. I'm outside of you. I'm not in you. And you're not in me. But I stand at the door and knock. He says, repent. He says, be zealous and repent. In Luke 15, if you'll read this, we find the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. So if you will read for us, Amy, Luke 15, 3 through 10. Let's read that. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it at his shoulders, rejoicing, on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice for me, for I found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons, just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay, so in all these parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, um, there's one thing that causes heaven to repent. What is it? One thing. Rejoice. Rejoice. Oh, well, when, someone, when a sinner repents. It when one on. sinner repents. Yes. And so this is a fitting analogy when, you, when we're looking at this woman who's lighting a lamp. And where, so the lamp is the word of God because thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. The word is also a mirror, according to James. That is a mirror that shows us the true condition of our heart. And um, the lamp, we, we're having a church meeting here because we are the church. We are the temple. We are the place that God lives. And in this day and time, literally in the last few months, we have been barred from meeting as a church body. I mean, globally, the church cannot meet in, in homes. So you could think of this, even this lesson, as as the Lord being um, bringing the light into the church house to people who maybe think that they're saved, but they're really lost. And so you could think of this as like a warning signal, a path um, to, to shine across the, the path to death row. That's what my children, as, as I was writing the study and my husband was painting it, my, cut, my children named this death road, which is appropriate because we are Ephesians 2. We're born spiritually dead. So Jesus is a seeker who is knocking on the door of your heart. Not only is he the seeker who's knocking, not only is he the one who has come seeking to save what is lost, um, which is his lost sheep. He wants to bring you into his fold. He's also the door. He is the door. And it's a shape of a cross with arms wide open. I, 
I stand at the door of your heart and knock. So he wants to come in, but he's, he desires to come in to your life to rule as your king. He doesn't want to come in to just be your friend. Oh, he is a friend. And he will send the friend, the helper, the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. But he's more than that. He is the king. And, and he said, Jesus said in another place, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And again, the house that stands, the person who stands the test of time, the person who is on that narrow road that leads to life, is going to persevere. They're going to not just hear what God says. When he says, Repent, and I'll come in. Repentance and faith. These are the things that Paul says I preach everywhere. Repentance towards God and faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we receive. That's how we walk through the door. That's how we receive Him as our Lord and Savior. Not just our Savior, but our Lord. He wants to be our King. So in conclusion, I just want us to take a moment to let this truth sink in. If you are trusting in anything... In any, or anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, then you are still lost and on that road to death. But you don't have to remain there. Right here, right now, you can make a U-turn. It's called repentance. In each of the above parables, what happens on earth that causes a joyful celebration in heaven? It is one sinner who repents. Could you be that one? If so, then turn around in, in repentance and put your faith on the one whom God, your Father, put your sins. Then when you do, you will know that your name has been written in the only role that ultimately matters, the Lamb's Book of Life. So that that is the end. So again, I want to read Matthew 7, the memory verse for this lesson. Enter through the narrow gate, because the gate is wide, and the way is spacious that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter it. But the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So I pray that God will use this lesson in your life. If you are on the wide road. But I also pray that you who are on the narrow road. If you have the signs of life and you have been born again, then God has left us here. He's not come to get us. He's not coming to get us until the door's not going to be shut until that last person hears the gospel. And I believe that many of those who are going to be saved in the end are going to be people who thought that they were already saved. So I pray that God's going to use his word. Thanks for listening.